Okay. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is Carly. I am um, going to be facilitating our session tonight. Um, I am with the Regenerative Culture Working Group of Extinction Rebellion Vancouver. Um, so we are a um, a nonviolent civil disobedience organization that organizes mm -hmm. of, um, actions and activities in the Vancouver area. Um, so the session that we are doing tonight is specifically nonviolent direct action training for Ferry Creek and Vancouver actions. Um, so before we uh, before we get started and dive in too deep, um, I do want to take a second at the beginning here um, to acknowledge and recognize that we are on the unceded. Uh, unsurrendered and stolen lands of the Coast Salish people here where, where I am, um, in the lands that uh, so-called Vancouver, the, in particular on the lands of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil people. And um, speaking for myself and hopefully on behalf of a lot of us uh, with Extinction Rebellion, we are always working to be in good relation with the uh, host nations on this land. Um, recognizing that they have been the stewards of the lands that we live and work on and play on for thousands of years since time immemorial. And um, it is important that we that we recognize uh, this, this um, opportunity and time that we have to be good allies and to um, be supportive. But I do also want to open it up. I don't know who is in the session here tonight, if there is anybody who is um, indigenous to this land or um, indigenous to Turtle Island that would like to add anything. I do want to leave this opportunity if anybody else would like to add anything to my land acknowledgement. Okay. I just want to yeah, go ahead. observe that I'm joining from the city of Toronto at home. Um, also, I want to acknowledge that they are the historic and ancestral lands of the uh, Mississaugas of the Credit, Chippewas, and other First Nations people. Thank you. Um, I welcome anybody else who wants to introduce themselves and the territory they're on to do so in the chat. Um, and at any point during the session, if you have any questions, um, feel free to pop them into the chat. We might hold them until um, the end, but it's good to have them into the chat whenever whenever they come up for you. Um, so I know there's a lot of us on this call, um, so I don't want to, you know, we often begin our sessions um, with check-ins about how we're feeling coming into this. Um, so, you know, I do want to leave that opportunity if anybody wants to um, check in and talk about how they're feeling coming into this session today. Um, so I can start for myself. Um, yesterday was quite a, an interesting day for a lot of us. You know, we had the news of the... Um, uh, the injunction, the end of the injunction, uh, or the injunction not being renewed at Ferry Creek, but also here in um, the Lower Mainland, we had our uh, some an anti TMX, the last anti TMX tree sit getting taken down. So it was kind of a positive and negative day. So lots of feelings coming out for us, uh, for some of us. Um, so I want to give an opportunity if anybody would else would like to check in how they're feeling coming in here today. Um, maybe the easiest way is to use the raise hand function, um, so that way I can call on you and we don't talk over each other. But anybody who feels like saying how they're feeling coming into the session today. Laura, Laura Jones. You can unmute yourself. <laughs> oh, that would help. Yeah, I was saying, I know there's some raise hand icon. I'm not sure how to make that work. Um, so I'm feeling, I mean, I was really related about the news about the injunction. I'm sorry to hear your news about the last tree set being taken down. And then there's the stuff happening up in Wet'suwet'en and, um, yeah, the, there's elation, but also knowing that it's kind of just a step in the, in the long run. Um, I'm feeling determined, even if it was the end and, uh, and, and Ferry Creek was all going to be fine. I still feel like that's just the beginning and there's so many things attached to, to deal with and to start getting a handle on over the long run. So I'm glad to be here to learn. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Kevin. Hi there. Um, I'm calling in today from uh, the Credit River watershed, 
where the Mississaugas of the credit. Um, I'm feeling apprehensive, yet excited, and um, within our area where I live, there is a, a sewage plant that has uh, that is avoiding consultation with the Indigenous peoples, the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I've been struggling locally to build the narrative to suggest that, you know, Canada is not paying attention and is doing all the things that they're doing right now to the Indigenous people out West. And earlier in the year, they were doing it when Nova Scotia over the lobster fishing, you know, and, and this water treatment plant is, is something that is, is woven with the same oppression, but doesn't get the narrative of, the, of what's happening out West, obviously, because there's so much happening out there. But I think it's important that we need to share the narrative that there's, there's oppression, similar oppression woven within projects in every watershed. And I think that that's what I would like to share with everyone, that I believe that there's, there's, there's places to be on every street, on every single street that represent the, the oppression that's happening out West. And my heart goes out to everybody that's involved out there. On the on the street, you know. I wish we could all be there, but thank you. All right, thank you. Um, anybody else feel like checking in? Oh, I feel like I heard somebody. Um, okay. Um, if anybody feels like checking in in the chat, you're also welcome to do that as well. Um. Okay, well, let's uh, let's move into our agenda for today. So um, I'll just quickly outline what we're going to be talking about today. So first of all, we're going to be talking about the importance of nonviolence and civil disobedience. Um, and then we are going to be looking at what to expect at Ferry Creek um, and what that, you know, what if we can talk at all about what it'll look like going forward, I think none of us are quite sure yet, but we'll have a little bit of conversation about that. And then um, we have Vic from the law, law Union who will give us a legal briefing and know your rights training. Um, and throughout, we're going to have some testimonials as well. Um, we're going to have some opportunities to hear from people who have been arrested either at Ferry Creek or here in the Lower Mainland. Um, if anybody also on the call, at, like later on, wants to share any of their testimonials of, of being arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience, want to welcome you to do that. Um, a reminder, it's uh, best not to talk about anything that's before the courts. Um, things that have been resolved is usually a better a better way to go. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Zane, who's going to talk about the importance of nonviolence and civil disobedience. Thanks. Um, usually when we do these trainings, it's, uh, sorry, just a minute. Sorry, my uh, battery was about to do that. So usually when we uh, talk about nonviolence and civil disobedience, it's sort of quite abstract and it's very, um, we don't really do a good job about it. And I think the first thing to recognize before we talk about civil disobedience to recognize the situation we're in. And I'll just briefly mention that. And like so, most of you have probably read about this and know about this, uh, about the recent IPCC report that came out. And what we've learned from that is that we're probably looking at two degrees of global average warming already locked in. And we've heard many euphemisms from NGOs and political parties about what that means and about how we're looking at the breakdown of civilization. But all, th all those things are euphemisms for social collapse and social collapse is a euphemism for mass rape and mass murder. And a lot of that is already locked in. And the reason why I mentioned this is because the climate emergency and ecological destruction is not about this thing called the environment. 
And that's one of the fundamental changes we need to make in how we understand this crisis, is that it's not this thing in the corner called the environment that we need to take care of. And as long as we do that, we're fine. We're looking at the greatest genocidal act in human history, because over two degrees of global average temperatures increase, you cannot grow food in many parts of the uh, part of the world. And when you can't grow food in many parts of the world, you're looking at mass starvation. And a lot of that is already locked in. And that brings me to this, the purpose of this meeting, which is to talk about civil disobedience and why that's necessary. And I think we wouldn't be having this call if there were people dying in Vancouver and Victoria right now. If there were people dying in Vancouver and Victoria right now because of climate emergency, everyone on this call would already be in prison. We would be lining up to take part in civil disobedience because people we know were, would be dying, our friends would be dying. And just due to the uh, repulsion, we would be we would feel morally inclined to enter into civil resistance to the point of being arrested. Uh, so yeah, the first thing to know about this is that it's not a tactic. Civil disobedience is not really a tactic. It's it's something that it's a consequence of being faced with a genocidal government. And when you're faced with a genocidal government, we our options typically become binary. Uh, and if you look at what was happening in the 1930s with fascism, people either had the option of entering into civil resistance against fascism, or people could be complicit in that. And what that looked like was if you entered into civil resistance against fascism, you were looking at, uh, you're entering into a serious state of risk. You could be killed, you could be arrested, you could be imprisoned, or you could, uh, or you could be fined. And, but the alternative to that is to be complicit in that. And so I'll be giving a few examples of uh, civil disobedience, civil, successful civil disobedience throughout history. And the first thing that comes to mind is that of the civil rights movement and the freedom riders movement. And the thing about the freedom riders is that uh, one, of the, one of the tactics that was deployed in the civil and uh, freedom riders movement was this idea of filling up the prisons, right? And so the fundamental understanding there was that there's, after a certain point of arrest, the state has to submit to whatever the demand of the movement is. So with the Freedom Riders, as with Ferry Creek, the demand is very small and it's what you call a dilemma demand, meaning that you can either be repressed in which case people support you or you win in which you get a win and then you can build, you can build from there. And with the Freedom Riders movement, by the time they had around 420 arrests, the government was saying that they won't negotiate with the Freedom Riders. But by the time they had 450 arrests, they got major legislative change to desegregate busing in the inner states. And so what we learn here is a principle that there's a binary number out there that after you cross that number, it's just too many arrests for the government to do anything about it. And after, after that point, you it goes non-linear and you have, you're looking at a major political event in the country. So I'll briefly talk about what our plan is for Vancouver in, in mid-October. We plan on doing two weeks of disruptive actions in Vancouver by doing actions that shut down the city. And during those actions, every single day, people are going to be arrested. And our demand is for the government to end subsidy, subsidies for all fossil fuels. And it's, it's a demand where it's happening right before COP26. And because of that, you're going to be looking at a scenario where the prime minister will be under pressure during COP26 because he's going to be pre pretending to be good on climate change while 100 people are getting arrested in, uh, in Vancouver for, to demand action on climate change. One of, the th one of the other things we learned from the Freedom Riders movement was that there was an explicit intention to provoke violence. And if you look at the videos of the Freedom Riders, they used to have nonviolent direct action trainings where they would talk about what the purpose of the action was and what effect that would have. And during those trainings, people would uh, uh, train in getting beaten up in, the, in pretending that the police is yelling at them, calling them all sorts of stuff. And the purpose of that training was to be prepared for the actual confrontation. So by the time they were actually in the space of conflict, uh, breaking the law, you were looking at the people who were trained being cool as bricks. So because what the state wants from you, what the police wants from you is to 
is to get violent and to overreact because the moment that happens, the elites have a very good time shutting everything down, which is why it's important to know that maintaining nonviolent discipline is not just a moral thing, it's a practical thing. And it's also a state of mind. It's not really a tactic, as I mentioned earlier. When you're standing in a bus stop and there are people there who aren't talking, they're just not talking. But if you enter into a room where people are meditating together, they're in a state of silence. So it's about the intention to the action. And this is something that is extremely important to embody during civil disobedience actions, is to embody the sense of nonviolence, of, uh, that you, but you're still breaking the law. So it's about being not as nonviolent as possible, but also breaking the law. Because for the past 30 years, we've had a situation where we've been doing petitioning, we've been doing marches, we've been doing rallies, and carbon emissions have gone up by 60%. So whatever we do next, engaging in the same actions we've been engaging in for the past 30 years is, is, is something that's completely illogical. So what we knew, what we do know is not breaking the law doesn't work. And there are many ways in which people can break the law. You can either stop construction directly or you can, um, or you can uh, sit down on the roads. And I wanted to talk a little briefly about arrests, which is that there's this, a lot of hesitation around the process of arrest and especially in the global North. But the thing to know here is that, so I've been arrested eight times and most of the fear that people have about being arrested is mostly psychological. And the only reason why that fear exists is because it's presented to people as a tactic. And the more we present uh, arrests as a tactic, the more optional it becomes and the more it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And as I mentioned earlier, if there were people dying in our neighborhoods right now, we would already be lining up to do civil disobedience and to risk arrest. Uh, and the thing to know about the climate emergency is that there is this lag that exists between carbon emissions and an increase in temperatures. And because of that lag, it's easy to, to rationalize the situation and to not enter into civil disobedience. But what we need to know is that it's already locked in on paper. And we, we have a few people who are expert reviewers of the IPCC saying that it's not like we've got a few years left. We are now in negative years. And what that, that reveals to us that there's this tendency in intellectual circles to keep moving the goalpost ahead. So three years from now, it's going to be, we've got three years left. And when those three years run out, it's going to be three years more left. So the only option we have is to, to, to enter into civil disobedience without worrying about how many other people are entering to civil disobedience. But this is another dogma in activist communities is about, well, we should engage in, engage in civil disobedience when we have enough people. But historically, we know that that's not how social change takes place. It begins always with a small group of people, as with the Freedom Riders Movement. The Freedom Riders Movement began with four people, and it was an extremely unpopular decision within the civil rights movement. The four people who started off that campaign were on a phone call with Martin Luther King and a few other leaders of the civil rights movement. And it was an, they were advised to not go ahead with this campaign, but they chose to do it anyway. So the thing to know here is that successful and effective civil disobedience always begins with a, a small group of people who decide to do what's right, regardless of who's supporting them. And the paradox here is that that is exactly what brings in a lot of people. And so after four months, you were looking at a major politi political event in US history where 400 people were in prison. Um, I'll, I'll just talk a little more about the theory of change here, which is that there's, there's a reason why mass arrests and mass civil disobedience works. And I'll just give a recent example of this happening in the global north. But there's this woman called Erica Chenuet, and she did a lot of research into civil disobedience and the history of civil disobedience uh, across the world over the past hundred years. And what she learned was that if you're a nonviolent movement, you have, and if you break the law in numbers, you have a 55% likelihood of success if you're nonviolent. If you're violent, you have a 25% likelihood of success. And what the, what the model she was looking at is called the Global South Civil Resistance Model. And the Global South Civil Resistance Model is basically a model where people, when they're faced with tyrannical governments, they go down to the major cities and the capital cities and they sit down on the road for a period of 14 days 
and they have arrests every day. And by the end of the 14 days, you're looking at a major political event or the disintegration of the government. And the reason why we, we're looking at these options now is because everything else we've been doing for the past 30 years has not worked. And we're looking at two degrees of global average warming or already locked in. And therefore, Western governments are now guilty of genocide because people in Africa won't be able to live in a two degree world. And then two degree, as we all know, is the global average, including oceans. And what we need to look at is the land average. The land average is five degrees. And it's only two degrees when you include the ocean. And as most of you may know, human beings live on land. And five degree increase in global average temperatures is you're just looking at billions of people facing starvation. And when we're looking at billions of people facing starvation, we need to put aside our egos and our intellect before we make the decision of whether or not we want to get arrested. And once we make that decision of what we need to do emotionally, what one has to do when they're faced with a genocidal government, then after we've made the right decision, then we can use all our egoey intellectual aspects of our brain and come up with a good plan and uh, mobilization strategy. But the first thing we need to know is what is our moral duty? And I know in Western culture, we've really abandoned this idea of having moral duties and having civic duties. But we need to remember that our rights come with certain responsibilities and they come with certain duties. And in the present context, it's our duty and a moral imperative to rebel against the Canadian government. And what, the, what this practically looks like is risking arrest either on construction sites or sitting down on the road in the city centers, blocking traffic. And the reason why blocking traffic is also this new strategy is because this is something that came about in the civil rights movement where Martin Luther King and others realized that it's not just about doing bad things to bad people. We're in a society that's in the middle of a moral crisis where everyone sort of knows, yeah, racism is a bit of an issue, but no one is really acting like it. And the way the civil rights movement uh, uh, decided to solve this issue was by disrupting society. So the most famous example here is the Selma, Alabama march. And what happened in Selma, Alabama was that uh, Martin Luther King and a few hundred other people occupied a famous bridge in Alabama. And as you all may know, there was a racist governor at the time in Alabama called George Wallace. And what he was saying was that I cannot allow this march and this blockade of the bridge to take place because it's going to disturb the good commuters of Selma. And this is a very familiar argument that we hear nowadays is that we shouldn't block roads, we shouldn't block bridges, we shouldn't cause disruption because you know, we're disrupting ordinary people. But the thing to know here is that we're part of a family in society. And when you're part of a family in society, it's our moral obligation to wake them up to the fact that we're faced with a genocidal government. So I'll just, oh yeah, I'll just give another example uh, of movements throughout history, which is the ACT UP movement in New York. And the ACT UP movement was founded by Larry Kramer, who was an AIDS activist, and he was uh, and the ACTA movement was taking part in civil disobedience to raise awareness about the AIDS epidemic in, in the country. And what they, what Larry Kramer once said, and this is a quote from him, is that we threw the dead bodies of, of our, we threw the ashes of our dead lovers at the White House. We showed the dead bodies to the press. We did whatever it nonviolently takes to bring attention to this issue. So this is what we really need to know going into any form of legal training is that the only chance we have of survival or and of mitigating this crisis is by doing whatever it nonviolently takes. And so it's not about getting arrested as long as it's convenient for us because people weren't told that in the civil rights movement. When you went to a civil rights movement, you were told that when you get arrested and when you go to prison, you will lose your job, you will uh, lose your home and you will face financial constraints. And they were told that they needed to, it's important to do this because there is no other option. And that's when people realize that there is no other option left, then it becomes an easy decision. And it wouldn't have been an easy decision in the 1990s because you weren't looking at two degrees of global average warming at the time, but it is an easy decision now in my, in my view. So yeah, I'll just, yeah, I'll just leave with, with I'll just leave with that. And maybe we'll hand over to, Carly, and I think someone's going to talk about what's to be expected at Ferry Creek. All right, thanks, Zane. 
Um, yeah. So, I mean, Zane there just told us a lot about why uh, nonviolence and civil disobedience um, is necessary um, and, you know, why a lot of us are choosing to, you know, put our put our privileges on the line uh, for things that we that we believe in. Um, then that's important and that's essential for the survival of, of the whole of, you know, everybody on this planet. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to um, Gumboot. Uh, who's going to talk a little bit more um, about Fairy Creek specifically. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I had wanted to get a who'd been working on the injunction to speak today, um, but a lot of them are quite busy reporting on exactly that in other forums right now. And I'd hoped as well to get someone from on-site because most people who are still on-site have been up in the bush have been arrested multiple times uh, to speak. I did reach out really last minute, but it was a bit last minute and I hadn't thought about it ahead of time. Um, so I apologize for that, but there are possibly people on this call who have been up to Fairy Creek um, recently and who may be able to, if there's questions at the end, who may be able to answer specific questions. And I think I'm just gonna keep it short too, like I did last time. Um, again, I'm really thankful that we were able to put this um, together again. Um, it's the second time uh, that I've been a part of these sessions and our last one that we had, uh, we got a lot of great feedback from. And the idea for me in reaching out to people and in hosting this session was to reach out and communicate and pull in, you know, so whether it's silent observers or anyone who's interested, anyone who has that itch, that curiosity, but is maybe still sitting on the fence because it's not normal yet. Getting arrested has is not normal yet. It hasn't been normalized. There's this uh, about it. And, but in comparison to like going to interviews, staying in touch with going to interviews so that you don't get those jitters when you go to an interview, um, doing things as a daily practice and that protesting is a daily practice and that getting arrested doesn't have to be a bad thing. We've all grown up in a very authoritarian system, authoritarian school systems, and we are used to following the rules, even though we intellectually sometimes know better, um, actually uh, stepping into behaviors and really being comfortable in those moments, because like Zane said, which I reiterated last time too, it's very much a state of mind and to remain at peace in these moments is not easy if you don't normally have interactions with cops, if you haven't been arrested before. And that sort of the whole point is to get used to being arrested so that when you are being arrested, you can remain peaceful and in a meditative state because that presence while being arrested will have ripple effects throughout the cops, throughout the, you know, in terms of leading by example and other people finding the courage to follow suit and do the same thing because it doesn't have to be a dirty word. It doesn't have to be a big deal. It just, it's how we communicate and it's how we keep moving forward. Um, and it's how we keep improving upon injustices and um, moving forward as a society. So that's sort of why I always call this together. And I don't always feel like I'm the best person to speak to specifics um, about what's going on at Fairy Creek. I am a good person to reach out to and I can normally connect you with the person who has the answers. Um, and so everyone's invited to ask me questions, maybe more so at the end specific to Fairy Creek um, and or um, anything they'd like to know, because I'm always open to that. I'm available online, on signal, through phone calls. Um, more and more I'm having phone calls with people before they get to site. And it's proving to be very effective because it allows people to take in information in the comfort of their own home, not in the middle of a meeting when they've shown up and everyone's being pulled to go places and maybe get arrested. You can really, and that's the point of these sessions too, is to, we can only do so much role play. It's really difficult to role play getting arrested. Um, you sort of just got to keep showing up and keep being there. And eventually if you don't already 
have the oomph because consent is important and throwing yourself into a situation that you're not going to be comfortable in and you're going to lose that state of mind might not always be the best sort of there's a you sort of got to check your comfort zone like am I ready to be somewhat uncomfortable and will I be relatively able to keep presence um, or maybe is this too much for me and will actually in the long run have, have a negative effect on my mental health because we want everyone showing up on site as prepared mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually as possible. Um, and, and that's what we're all there for. That's what the community is there for too. So I think that's what I'll say and I'm happy to answer questions at the end or direct people at the end. Amazing, thank you, Sarah. And um, just on that note, Sarah, if if there's some way that people are like the best way for people to contact you, feel free to pop that in the chat so that if anybody wants to reach out, they can do that. Um, uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Vic now with the Law Union, and um, I'm sure he will like specifically address the question that is already in the chat, which is about like how um, getting arrested can have an impact on things like criminal record checks um, and amongst other things to know um, in terms of legal briefing and know your rights. So with that, I will pass it over to Vic. Wonderful, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? I wanna make sure the audio is just fine. Fantastic, um, I'm just gonna amend. Also, Carly, did you want me to speak a little bit about the legal developments and the injunctions of the ruling this week, or do you want me to just go right into KYR? And if it comes up in questions, then we can I mean, if you want, if you can address it briefly, I think like, um, I mean, maybe a lot of people on this call might have seen kind of like the things, like I was saying at the beginning, I've seen what's on, on social media. So kind of the, the paragraph that has been highlighted, but it'd be great to know kind of what the implications of that might be. I know we're not going to know really what it's going to look like up at Berry Creek for another a little while yet, but yeah, any implications to that ruling would be great. Sure. So as many of you heard, um, there was a, a Greasy Supreme Court application Mary, uh, made um, to basically renew the pre existing injunction uh, at date of expiry. Injunction, this injunction had been uh, put in place previously. I won't get into that because you all know about it. But essentially, what happened early this week, um, and on Tuesday the ruling was released, was that the court heard and rejected a renewal request of the injunction. I think a lot of people are actually reading this particular decision because it was a pretty powerful statement was made in it. Um, I wouldn't suggest reading it because it's over 140 paragraphs, but that's actually the normal size of a ruling. It's important for what we're doing here today. And I just want to highlight three key points about it. It did not strike down the previous injunction. I think that's a little bit of a misunderstanding. It denied the company's renewal of an injunction. The, the, the justice pointed out that the courts of British Columbia are not obliged to provide injunctions simply because they're asked on behalf of private companies. Um, the justice held that the courts are acting on behalf of the Crown, so a very particular public interest role. Despite being not obliged to do so, he did give it consideration and he rejected it. He rejected the renewal because he basically made a statement that um, the, the injunction was used as a tool for RCMP instruction. The authority given to the court, to the police, and the way the police use it, quote, did no credit to the rule of law or the court's reputation because the measures used entrenched on civil liberties in a substantial way. That's an important thing to remember. Um, the court also uh, held that there were considerable infringements of civil liberties. These infringements cannot be justified, cannot be substantiated, and it constituted a serious breach. Um, unlawful measures that were imposed by the RCMP were also held to be not part and parcel of the previous injunction. So remember that this justice in this 140 paragraph ruling didn't say, I'm not renewing just because. He's basically saying, I'm not renewing because the RCMP was taking my previous injunction and using it to disavow the civil liberties of Canadians. And the court's reputation was held terribly as a result it, on those grounds. And it's quite a public document to read this. And I just wanna give everyone a little bit of context before we go forward. So 
Um, as was stated, um, my name is Vikram. I'm a member of the British Columbia Law Union today, and I'm joining this call to speak to you more particularly about um, nonviolent direct action and knowing your rights, and just give a tidbit of legal education going forward. Uh, before I begin, I want to make clear that what I take today is not to be considered as personal legal advice in any way, shape, or form for anyone. I'm only speaking about hypotheticals, hypothetical nonviolent direct actions, hypothetical future events at unspecified future locations in British Columbia or across Canada. So you should begin when you approach a collective role like nonviolent direct action or organizing with assessing and deciding to risk arrest. You have to ask, am I going to be putting myself in a restable scenario? Will I, have, will I be um, within view of a police officer? Will I be um, on the front lines close to a police line? And uh, I want to open that up by saying, when you give consideration to being arrested, that's very much a personal decision to be weighed on a cost benefit analysis, both in your own life and to the movement. There's many ways to serve climate justice. So what to do if one does decide hypothetically to risk arrest? Well, the first thing is to get a little bit of a legal education. I think that's what some are attempting to do today and get to know your rights. The first thing to do is to identify someone to have on call, whether that's um, someone legal who's attached to particularly with Extinction Rebellion, whether it's a lawyer you know personally, whether that's a legal buddy that's gonna be at, the, at any potential action with you, but have someone that you can call and write their phone number in permanent marker on an arm or a leg of your own. And I'm saying that because if you are arrested, all your personal effects can be taken from you, including your phone. And you still want to be able to clearly identify a means of communication. Also, if you're putting yourself on the front line risking arrest, having a buddy or notifying someone beforehand that, hey, this is what I'm doing today. Hypothetically, this could be the outcome. It lets, it lets the movement track you through the process of being held in custody, arraigned, read, read rights, served a summons. This all could take 15 minutes. It could take 12 hours. We don't know. So it's important that other people know who you are and you can clearly get in contact with them. That's important. I want to actually let me describe it this way quickly. We're talking about informing yourself and informing others at the same time. That's a, that's a, that's a, a good way to sort of to remember it. Um, inform yourself in terms of understand the goals and options and prepare yourself for an arrest. And second, inform others. Now I, I said inform others as a means of legal protection. Inform others also in case you have particular medical needs or special needs. Those have to be communicated to legal support. Why? Because if you are taken into custody, you no longer have the personal autonomy you do when you're outside in the real world. As a result, you won't be able to take, to get access to prescription medicine or other medicines that might be essential to you. If you communicate that effectively to someone outside, we can contact whatever policing authority has taken you into custody, say, hey, that person needs every three hours and every six hours. If you are, if you do require uh, medication, I'd say uh, any any time within a one hour to twenty four hour cycle, I would bring it in clearly marked bottles to that end. What else do I have, do I have to think about other than my personal medical needs when I'm preparing for an arrest? Think about the consequences of any potential charge. There are maybe four or five key charges most people doing nonviolent direct action in the climate justice movement have faced in British Columbia, I'd say in the last two and a half to three years. But everyone has to consider by themselves what exactly that means for them, what your immigration status is, how a pending charge might affect it, employment, what your HR says about a possible arrest, et cetera, et cetera. In that vein, you have to do a little bit of consideration of where we'll put you. The more you're prepared to take part in nonviolent direct action and be arrested, the stronger the movement is. So this is a little bit of home, uh, personal homework that you can do to prepare for a day of action. So let's say, for example, I have a legal buddy. Let's say, for example, 
I've taken account of everything I need to do and I've decided to put myself on the front line and I'm attending a nonviolent direct action with a group of friends. It's the day that I'll be risking arrest. Preparing to do so, four things to keep in mind. The first is bring only an identification, pen and paper. That's very, very important. Leave at home any weapons of any sort that could, that could include even um, something pokey on a keychain that if a police officer searched uh, your pockets, it could poke them, a wallet, unnecessary. And ordinarily, we tell people to, keep, to not bring their phones with them. Now, the tricky thing about that is that in British Columbia, the courts have ruled that police officers do not need a warrant to open your phone and read text messages and look at your call history, et cetera. That's incredibly important if you're a collective and you're acting as a collective when you're taking action to protect yourself and protect others. So if I'm arrested on a, on a specific day, hypothetically, the last thing I want is police going to my phone and being able to name and identify others. That's incredibly important. To that end, a powerful reminder for everyone if you're taken into custody, not to talk to police above and beyond two things. Identifying yourself, meaning birth date, legal address, full name. And then hypothetically, if one does require uh, medical needs, as I stated previously, that can be stated. Other than that, I would impl implore everyone to not speak to the police about any details of what's happened that day, the planning that was particular to it, about your personal motivation, about the motivations of others, or anything of the sort. It's incredibly important to protect others in this movement by not speaking to the police, not volunteering that kind of information. So let's say, for example, I'm on the front lines of an action, hypothetically. Let's say that day police approach me. Let's say, for example, police have stopped me, start asking me questions. You always have the right to ask a police officer, are you under arrest? Are you being detained? They could say you're being detained for questioning. They could say, yes, you're under arrest, or they could say, no, you're not. If you're not being held for questioning, if you're not under arrest, you're free to go. You're free to walk away from the police at any time. If you are under arrest, you have a, you have a right to be known what you're being arrested for. Again, the police, when they officiate an arrest, will begin a line of questioning. Only provide your date of birth, your full name, your legal address, nothing else. And it's important to remember also though that being arrested is something that could be relatively traumatic for some people insofar as it's felt differently by people of different backgrounds. Everyone has a different experience and history with the police. When you're taken into custody, you're usually grabbed at or they'll take possession of you by touching a shoulder, an arm, a wrist, a hand first. You no longer have control of your body like you ordinarily would. You no longer have freedom of movement and that kind of autonomy when you're taken into custody. That can be very uncomfortable for some people. That can be especially traumatic for indigenous, trans, queer, members of the LGBTQ plus community, women, anyone who could say, I am totally comfortable in police custody, I just don't believe. It's not a pleasant experience. And like I'm saying, some of us have to take stock of ourselves a little bit and be weary of the fact that it can be a traumatic experience. Whoever you are, if you're taking part in nonviolent direct action, I think that takes nothing but a fantastic amount of courage and deciding to, to risk arrest is definitely a bold personal choice to make. So what happens when I'm arrested? Now, let's say, like I said, I've identified myself, I've shown them my ID, I don't have my phone on me. I do have a right to silence. I don't have to say anything. They are gonna search me. There's always an automatic search that is incidental to an arrest. They don't need my consent for that. And that includes my person, my body, and any bags, purses, a satchel, anything I might have on me. They will seize all personal effects other than my clothes that I'm carrying with me at that point. 
And please also remember, in terms of personal comfort and bodily autonomy, you have the right to request a man or a woman to search you physically. We've seen a varying sort of processes, particularly on the island, when police arrest um, those involved in nonviolent direct action. Some are held for 15, 20 minutes and released. Some are held for much longer. So there's a variable amount of time that you will be in custody. You're likely to be released under, under your own undertaking. That will represent itself as I've been arrested, I've been identified, the police will explain to me while I'm being arrested, breaching an injunction, mischief, trespass, whatever it might be. They'll give me a piece of paper that's about the size of a large parking ticket. I will have my name, it will have the charge, all of the arresting officer's name, and it will say a time of a time and a location where I have to go to court. It's a promise to appear in court to meet the charges. On the back or on the front sometimes, they have conditions of release written in. These conditions of the release have been problematic in the past because they stipulate that, hey, we'll release you after just an hour of holding you, but you're not allowed to rejoin the others you arrived with, or you're not allowed to come within 500 meters, a kilometer, or you're not allowed, it's these kind of particular stipulations. If you find this to be too problematic, you are free not to sign the promise to appear, and you will likely be held until you can appear before a justice or a judge in British Columbia, and you can at the time although i would highly recommend having counsel with you when you're doing this you can contend and challenge what those terms of release are in the past we've had very very reasonable justices strike down some of those uh, conditions of release particularly because if i can't travel within a, a kilometer of a protest but my place of work and place of residence is 500 meters away that's problematic so on the surface some of these stipulations that are put on people for conditions of release can be contended with The charges themselves were always met at a later date because of COVID and because of a backlog in provincial courts, we're often seeing some something between the likes of four months to eight months before people are, are, are in court to meet these charges. Remember, there's no assumption of guilt because you've been arrested or facing a charge. That's a second step where you retain counsel, where you'll get legal defense in order to meet those charges. To put a lot of this into, into context, just to remember four key things. Before you risk arrest, remember taking stock of your own life and making a decision in a forthright manner, communicating it with others. There are many ways to serve the climate justice movement. The day of risking arrest, being adequately prepared, meaning what I bring with me and having a plan. Number two, excuse me, number three, if I am arrested, not speaking to the police, um, communicating, identifying myself, I mean, communicating birth date, address, identifying myself, bringing nothing suspect like pepper spray or anything like that in my bag. Number four, understanding that I'll probably be released under my own consent if I sign uh, terms of promises to appear. If not, I'll probably stay in custody for about 24 hours and be brought before a judge. Um, I don't, I, I can't see the chat, so I don't know if any questions have popped up. It's a lot to take and I know in one short, rather shorter session. Yeah, uh, people are starting to put questions in, um, but I was just gonna hang on to them for a little bit um, and let you, if, if you're done, we can look at at, uh, at questions. I thought there's a couple in there just about cell phones um, and whether, is it a crime to refuse to give your password once you're arrested to your phone? And um, is it okay to just destroy your phone as opposed to risking any intrusion? That sounds dramatic. Um, <laughs> no, it's not. What I mean by that is that if your phone's unlocked, they can just swipe it. We, we know lots of instances where police have just taken someone's fingerprint and opened their phone. If you're, I, I don't know what um, XR and the other groups in terms of strategy um, have in terms of who's like who's taking photos and who's catching police action on video. I'm not advising on that. Just from a legal perspective, if you are going to bring your phone, if you absolutely must bring your phone, have a numeric, a complicated numeric code to unlock it. They're not allowed to like plug it in and back it up and then have 
the RCMP crack it. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that they can take it from you. Can, excuse me. They can take reasonable efforts to get it unlocked. Um, so if it's like your birth date, if it's you know your postal code, if it's something like that, and definitely not a, um, a fingerprint. That, I think that's. I think that would suffice. Yeah. Or facial recognition. Yeah. Um, great. Um, I'm going to let uh, people keep uh, adding their questions into the chat, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, I just want to take a second here um, to uh, maybe add a bit more information uh, from the XR Vancouver, uh, particularly one of my main roles is arrest support. So I'm just going to sort of walk people through what happens, um, some, some of the scenarios of what can happen when getting arrested here. Um, so typically when at, you know, an event where you decide to, um, you know, maybe stay on the streets. What happens is that the police will give announcements and they will give many, many announcements and warnings that they are coming. Um, this is one thing that I really want to highlight is that the police, especially here in Vancouver, they're not sneaking up on anybody or like trying to catch anybody in arrest. Um, they give everybody all opportunities to leave. Um, so when you decide to be arrested, um, people tend to stay sitting on the road um, or, or in whatever place they are. They will come up to you and again really like ask you directly do you want to be arrested or will you leave the will you leave the road so if you decide that you are going to take that stand um typically before doing this this is where um xr arrest support can come in useful or if you're at fairy creek or somewhere else if you do have your phone on you just give it to someone else right give it to your friend or give it to one of the or like arrest support people we will hang on to your stuff same with your keys and just all of your stuff. What we have had happened in the past is that it's not necessarily that the police are going to take your stuff, um, as has happened at Ferry Creek, um, but just that sometimes it can take longer to get it back. So the easiest thing is to just give all your stuff to someone else, and um, then you have only your ID on you. Um, and then they will take you away. They will use your ID to answer all the questions that they have on their papers. They'll read you your rights. Um, and lock you into the police van. So the police vans, this is something I like to give people a little bit of heads up um, on, is that it is a small space. You are locked into quite a small, you know, really um, a box that's just big enough for you. Um, and the lights go on and off. So this can be um, a little disconcerting. And I think sometimes it is meant to be that. Um, but, you know, for, um, it, I've heard lots of people say they sing inside there, the acoustics are great. <laughs> um, or just close your eyes and meditate, you know, focus on the self. Um, this is one way that like really focusing on calming yourself because you are alone, right? You go from being in a group to being alone and that can be um, a little bit scary, um, but know that everybody outside is um, there to support you. Um, they will take you to the police station here in Vancouver. Um, they go to Maine and Cordova. They will take you out. Um, it can be, honestly, the last time someone got arrested here, it was 15 minutes and they were released. Um, other times, like several months ago, it might've been a couple of hours. Um, and again, they give you that promise to appear with a court date and a fingerprinting date and um, you know the, the conditions. Um, here in Vancouver, we mostly have people signing the, the conditions for release um, because they are often not very onerous and you can actually, there, we um, have some tools that people can have used to try and get the conditions changed at a later date rather than stay in um, jail overnight. Um, and then with XR here in Vancouver, we meet people right outside the police station with snacks and water and all of their stuff. Um, you know, often the welcoming group will be there to, you know, cheer you on when you come out. It's always lovely to have a friendly face. Up at Ferry Creek, very similarly, there is an arrest support team. Um, so when people are arrested and they are taken down and they are taken to the police station, there is always someone there with food and, and uh, water and, you know, support and a hug or whatever when you come out. And that is one of honestly the most amazing things. So if, if you're curious and just like experiencing what it's like to do arrest support, it's a great way to, um, uh, to sort of be on that end, um, be on the support end as people come out. Um, you really, it's the most, um, I don't know, it's the most gratifying experience to greet people. I see Sarah maybe has something to add to that as well. Yeah, I just realized I wanted to pop in there and just highlight what Vic had said about the permanent marker and writing someone's number on your arm. Um, because normally it 
you know, normally you sort of know if you're going to be arrested, you know, if there's a likelihood or a chance of arrest beforehand. So really prepping yourself so that when it does happen, and once you're taken to the station, you have a number of an arrestee support and or like at Ferry Creek. Now we have a lawyer on like we have a lawyer to reach out to every day and that lawyer changes sometimes, but we have their phone number and we it that is supposed to be communicated to everyone. And so I'm just highlighting times where things do fall through the cracks. So highlighting the importance of having that permanent marker and a permanent number on your hands and thinking ahead as well in terms of, you know, thinking of legal aid, like if this goes to something, what am I going to do? Am I going to approach legal aid? Do I qualify for legal aid? Do I have friends and family who would support me? Would I do a GoFundMe and, you know, have my own lawyer and go through with it? Or am I going to be relying at Ferry Creek specifically on the group of lawyers that we have working um, as much as they can uh, for a large group of people? Um, so yeah, I just wanted to highlight that, the name numbers on your body. And also if you, we do have a great team and we are following all the trucks everywhere. And I mean, things are going to change going forward too, but also what was just shared on signal is that it has been announced that Teal is going to appeal the decision. So just to keep that in mind as well. But if ever you wind up somewhere and you are let out and there's no one there, stay in place because someone is coming for you. <laughs> Please stay in place <laughs> and have a number on you so that you can use um, your phone when, or uh, a pay. so many people are normally kind enough to, and there's always a way to get in touch with someone if you have maybe one, two or three numbers written on your arm because in this day and age of cell phones, none of us tend to remember numbers anymore. Yes, thanks. It's a good reminder that also um, here in, this, in the city at XR Actions, we um, almost always have a hotline number um, that we give people to write on their arms. And then yes, it's always a good idea to write either the arrest support person's number or you know someone who can pick you up. Um, I think Zane, can you just pop into the chat and see and tell people where the recording is gonna be? Thanks. Um, and um, one more quick thing that I'll just let you know, um, for people who have uh, been arrested here in Vancouver, they do go through the court system. And I think similarly for Ferry Creek, people are going through the court system and it is multiple court dates. It is not just one. Um, it's really important if you do have, um, if you do qualify for legal aid to apply for legal aid, um, uh, because that will save um, everybody money. Um, I know XR Vancouver does not have uh, funds for um, supporting lawyers, although we are working on doing some fundraising for that. Um, Ferry Creek uh, does have some funds, but it is limited and um, they really prefer that, that that money is going towards, you know, folks who are marginalized, BIPOC folks, um, land defenders, things like that. So if you do have other access to um, ways to pay for legal fees, that's great. Okay, um, with that, I'm gonna check on the questions in the chat. Um, so feel free to um, add some more questions if you want. And if anybody else wants to um, you know, share their experiences um, in the chat, you're welcome to do that. Um, so one thing I know someone was asking about um, criminal record checks and uh, you know, I'll, I'll let Vic maybe answer that question, but it, is, um, it can also really depend um, so here in Vancouver, we've had people go through the whole court system and have ended up with uh, no criminal record um, and with, you know, maybe between 20 to 40 hours of community service. Now, of course, it's really important to note that nobody can predict what will happen going forward. Um, things can change and nothing, um, I mean, nothing with the at Ferry Creek has gone all the way through the court system yet. But that has been the experience here in Vancouver. Vic, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that about criminal record checks and how uh, it might before I do, Before I do, just because some of the questions might be of a personal nature, maybe we should stop uh, recording right now. Okay, that is a that is a great point. Um, yes, uh, okay, I'm gonna stop recording um, and I will pass it on. <laughs>